The types of questions and the demands, the, the nature of the demands that clients have had as they've developed more sophisticated ways of analyzing what their spend is, where their spend should be, who they're using and what's generating that spend, those kind of things. You know, they've gotten increasingly sophisticated in the questions they ask and the demands they make of the law firms that they work with. And those things are becoming pre-qualifying prerequisites for whether or not they're going to work with a firm. So someone in a pricing LPM type position or with that skill set is very well positioned to help not only sort of interpret what those needs are, but then translate them into, okay, I can make those um, actionable strategies for the firm. I'm Chad May, and this is Technically Legal, a podcast about the intersection of technology and the practice of law, where each week we'll talk to a different mover or shaker in the legal and technology field. We'll learn a little about them, what they've been up to, and hopefully get some real-world tips that will help lawyers better use technology in their legal practices. You just heard from Keith Mazierick. He's the Director of Pricing and Legal Project Management at the Chicago-based law firm Cat & Moochin. In this episode, we talk to Keith about the benefits of having a dedicated pricing and project management position in modern law firms and legal departments. In our Legal Founder segment, we talk to Kevin Miller. He's the CEO of Legal Sifter, an AI-backed contract analytics tool. This episode is about the pricing of legal services. You might be thinking a couple things about that. You might be thinking, why does pricing need its own position at a law firm? And what does pricing have to do with legal technology? No matter if you are a lawyer at a law firm or a client purchasing legal services, you are all too familiar with the mantra of more for less. Pick up any legal publication the last few years and you will read time and time again that clients expect lawyers to do more legal work for less costs. So what that means is lawyers must do their work cheaper and more efficiently. That's where tech comes in. Legal tech permits lawyers to become more efficient by automating certain parts of legal tasks and as a result requires fewer bodies on a project. Also, as Keith will talk about, Tech permits lawyers to gather data about pricing, which in turn helps those on both sides of the negotiating table and also provides crucial information about the time and effort it really takes to get legal work done. As part of this more for less conundrum, clients are demanding creative pricing from lawyers. Sometimes you will hear people talk about AFAs or alternative fee arrangements. As a result, many firms are hiring people like our guest, Keith Mazierick, to fill newly created positions solely focused on pricing and process improvements. Keith didn't start his career in legal. He started writing PR copy for his uncle's company and then moved into the tech industry in the early 2000s, where he started handling market responsibilities for a startup. Along came the dot-com crash, and Keith moved his marketing skills over to the legal industry, where he got a job in the marketing department of the American Bar Association. While at the ABA, Keith figured out that the legal industry's main trade association shared attributes of its law firm constituents, specifically siloed departments and opportunities to create working relationships between departments. You know, I worked at the ABA for four years, a little over four years. It's a it's an interesting place to go into work from the outside because there's a lot of people that are lifers there. And you come in from the outside and make a lot of observations. You would notice silos because you'd say, people over here are doing this. There's people on the other side doing this. Why don't we all come together and try and sort of, you know, mitigate some of the, the coordination issues and everything? Um, so I started doing more than what my job was supposed to be because I would raise my hand and go, hey, you know what? Do we ever think about connecting those two things or making a more sort of... Uh, uh, organized and streamlined approach to the way that the department does everything. And they'd say, no, that sounds great. Why don't you go do it? So I did a lot of those things and it was very interesting. It got to be a very dynamic job for me after a while because every time I raised my hand, they let me do other things. Uh, but what I started realizing over time was that from a career trajectory standpoint, I didn't feel like nonprofit was where I wanted to be, but I had, in the process of being at the ABA for that long, I learned how to work within the context of the legal world, working directly with lawyers and trying to coordinate with them and weigh um, and balance different priorities that they have to get the input that you needed or get the participation you needed, those kind of things. And I said, well, how is this a transferable skill? And I said, well, law firms, you know, there's marketing jobs. A lot of what I was doing was marketing and communications related. Maybe I'll try that. After the ABA, Keith took what he learned about connecting insular silo departments within an organization and used that knowledge at two business development roles with a couple of the United States' biggest law firms, Ackerman and DLA Piper. While holding a business development position at DLA, Keith also got his MBA at Northwestern. And it was then that he really started utilizing his skills to help DLA cope with the changing nature of the way legal work is done in the 21st century, the impact that technology is having on the law, and the changing client demands as a result of economic forces. Ultimately, Keith's role evolved into pricing and how to help law firms not only price their services to cope with client demands, but also how to manage legal projects and deliver value to clients. 
When you work in a big firm like that, BD, a lot of it is being a broker between people on opposite sides of the firm that don't know each other exist, but that can offer each other something for their work, so. Facilitator. Yeah, basically, yeah. Right. Saying, okay, just kind of connecting those dots, you know? And being in a position where you're, you're, you're kind of in a broker or an agent type position within the organization because you see across multiple silos or, or areas that other people don't. That's sort of a benefit of being in those positions and it sort of lends itself to being able to make those connections. And so do you ultimately get into a pricing position at DLA? Yeah, so here's what happened. When I was an undergrad, and when I was in high school, I always had, I was always in like AP calculus and all those advanced quant classes. And I said, I want to get more, uh, I want to get back into the analytical side of things and the quant side of things, as opposed to just being more of the qualitative side of things that tended to focus on more of what we did in BD and marketing back then. So my three majors at Kellogg were uh, managerial economics, management and strategy and analytical consulting, which is basically big data analytics, predictive analytics, those kind of things. And that was very calculated on my part, no pun intended. I wanted to actually, you know, focus on those things more and have those as the complement to the other side of things where I sort of knew you know, a lot about uh, different businesses and different industries and kind of what they were looking for from the legal services standpoint. That was a very uh, deliberate choice that I made as far as what I wanted to focus on there. And my thought when I went into Kellogg was I may not stay in legal. I kind of like the idea of going into management consulting. What happened was, so I started at Kellogg in 2007. When you go through the interviewing process at Kellogg, that's usually in the fall and it was the fall of 2009. And one of the worst times to interview in the last, you know, 15 or 20 years, I'd say, other than maybe right after the dot-com bubble, was, you know, during the financial crisis when nobody was hiring, right? I mean, there were people were laying people off in droves. It was hard. Uh, it was a hard time to interview with. They were very, you know, it was much more competitive. I didn't find a good path for me in, in management consulting to that process. And I was thinking at that point, 2009, 2010, I'm like, uh, or 2009, I'd say, yeah, I was like, well, what am I going to do after interviews ended? And I'm like, I don't know what, I wasted all this time and all this money. What am I going to do with my life now? I'm going to be stuck in the same role. Right around that time, one of our uh, the managing partner here in the Chicago office. Uh, at DLA. I, yeah, at DLA, yeah. Uh, Bill Rudnick, worked with him really closely. He's a JD at an MBA. Uh, he's an incredibly smart guy, incredibly gracious guy. He's a friend and a mentor to me still. We still catch up from time to time. Um, he said, look, you know, he had closely followed my MBA studies and I worked with him very closely in the substance of the BDE side of things for my job at, at that point. So he came to me and said, look, we need to, as a firm, we need to get more, get our arms more around what, what's happening within our industry because it's changing and the way we do business is going to be different from now on. And I want us to, and a lot of that's going to come down to how do we price our work? How do we create budgets? Uh, how do we, you know, deal with different technology opportunities that we have and implement those into the practice of seeing, you know, how we measure our work or how we're more transparent with our clients. All these things that are what actually, you know, came to fruition today. He's like, we need to learn about what we're doing well, what we're not, where we need to develop and how we need to make sure we're ahead of the curve on this. So anyway, long story short, he goes, you know, do you want to be the co-founder with me internally of a task force that gets our arms around all these things and starts setting up a plan for the, for the firm? I, more or less. And I said, yeah, I'd love to do it. There was all these things I want that would help me leverage what a lot of my studies were and also the environmental sort of awareness or information or knowledge that I already had from not only the firm, but also the industry. So that's ah, great. So little by little from 2009 on, I started getting more and more into the pricing thing. And it was like, okay, well, what are the different things clients are asking for? Are we doing those well? well you know, how are we measuring performance now? And that to me, I was learning, I was lucky because I started when a lot of other people kind of started doing this in general. And as I got more and more invested in it over time, I started trying to spend more time on that and less time on the BD stuff. Cause I saw number one, I, I was interested in it. I, it was intriguing to me. It was very very uh, rewarding to me. But then also at the same time, I felt like there was a new profession developing out of this. So there's going to be a specialty. There might be an opportunity for me there. So I wanted to, you know, kind of, you know, pursue that a little bit and see if it, if it turned into anything. So uh, I won't get into all the gory details of the process, but over time they said, look, we need to create a formal function at the firm to develop these things into formal departments or whatever form they take, but we need somebody to formally own it. You know, do you want to be that person? We know you've got experience in it. And I said, yeah, I'd love to do that. As noted, Keith's position at Catton is Director of Pricing and Legal Project Management. In this role, Keith has both internal responsibilities to the law firm itself and also external responsibilities to the firm's clients. There's internally facing work that I do, and then there's you know working with the partners, working with our in internal departments, marketing, BD, finance, IT, all those things, right? Uh, enabling the functions, basically, of, of pricing and LPM, right? So you need data, you need different ways of getting reporting generated, you need different types of applications, you can generate certain types of analytics and those kind of things, right? So those are all very internally focused, like how does a company do any like product development, right? That's an internally facing role, right? But marketing then puts it on the outside, right? So if you think about how those functions kind of are symbiotic, same kind of thing. 
So, you know, with what I do, you have to internally enable the analysis that you need and the, the types of reporting, transparency, all the infrastructure type elements of the functions need to be dealt with, managed, you know, developed, those kind of things. And then the externally focused stuff is, okay, well, how does that present itself to the client, either directly or indirectly. It could be me saying, hey, we generated these these reports that show you kind of a good bird's eye view and then a little bit more in the weeds view of sort of how our work is being done with you and where we see that there's opportunities to look at different ways to price things or efficiencies. So, you know, those kind of things are a very client-facing thing to either that or just how I enable the partners to better um, interact with some of their business side counterparts on the client side where to give them the tools or the information they need to be effective in, in those types of conversations as well. So it's, it's kind of both. So pricing and LPM are the overarching sort of disciplines, I would say. But then the way that those get done or the way that those sort of manifest have both internal and external sort of versions, I would say. We're going to step away from my chat with Keith for just a second. Now it's time for our Legal Founder segment. In today's segment, we talk to Kevin Miller. He's the CEO of Legal Sifter. Legal Sifter is an AI-based contracts analytics tool. Uh, Kevin, thanks for being here today. Tell us a little bit about Legal Sifter. Thank you, Chad. We really appreciate the interest. Legal Sifter has built a product to solve an age-old problem. You know, contracts are the most important, most prolifically used document in global commerce, and they're just a universal pain. They're hard to read, they're hard to negotiate, and we've built a product that reads that contract and gives in-context help or advice in a minute or two to anyone who needs it. Uh, using artificial intelligence. And we think it's a thing. Tell me, uh, what was the inspiration to develop the app? Well, you know, the company was originally founded out of Carnegie Mellon University here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And if you live in Pittsburgh, you know that Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh is just a hotbed of AI activity. I've personally been in and around AI for about 10 years. And our, our co-founders built a product for freelance software developers who never take their contracts to attorneys because they can't afford them. And they said, hey, upload your contract to this product and our product will review it and tell you what to think about and protect you. And they did that way back in 2000. 14, and they got 5,000 people to use the product in a week. And then they put it on the shelf. They, they weren't ready. The product was a beta. The leadership and the funding wasn't quite there uh, or where it needed to be. They, they weren't quite sure where they wanted to go. And I heard about the product about a year later after it had been on the shelf for about a year. And I thought, oh my gosh, you've built a product that reads contracts and gives advice. That's a big deal. And so I jumped in. We built the team out and we had to get the, the use case quite right. And we really wanted to partner with the legal community. And it took us really two years from that point to, to launch the product that's out on the market today. And uh, we're proud of it. And we, th we think we've built something that, that everybody is going to and wants. Give us the elevator pitch about two things. What exactly Legal Sifter does and its features, its unique features. Sure. So businesses, we'll start with the primary users and those are businesses. We'll talk about how businesses use it and law firms use it. So if I'm a business and I, I negotiate contracts all day long to run my, my business on the buy or the sell side, I typically have some combination of three issues. Either I have way too many people involved in the contract negotiation process and it takes me way too long because, you know, Chad, you're my boss and you're on vacation and then the lawyer's too busy and the IT person forgot and, and it slows things down. And that's a challenge for typically middle to larger businesses, some small. The second challenge people People face and the more common one is that they have only one person reviewing a contract, whether it's a lawyer or a non lawyer, by themselves reviewing a one to hundred page contract and trying to represent that organization as best they can. And then the third issue is really more on the solution that they have at their disposal. If you have inside counsel or even if you go to outside counsel, if you run your contracts through attorneys, oftentimes it's too slow and too expensive. Attorneys themselves don't have technology that helps them scale or do a lot more in the same hour than they otherwise could. And so they look very expensive and very slow for the average transaction. So you have some combination of too many people involved, one person reviewing a contract, or uh, it's too expensive or too slow to go outside counsel. Well, the product that we've built empowers you know, individuals uh, to either negotiate contracts by themselves, take on more of the work, thereby eliminating steps in that, in that situation where you have too many people involved. Or if you're by yourself, whether you're a lawyer or a professional, you tend to make fewer mistakes and you tend to read product contracts faster with the product. And the adage is a person plus an algorithm is stronger than either by itself. You know, if I have an individual reading a contract by themselves and then I have that individual read the contract with Legal Sifter, they're going to be faster, cheaper and better 
uh, meaning they'll make fewer mistakes, get to a better outcome if they use the product. And then finally, for lawyers, and this applies to law firms, we give them the opportunity to uh, become more efficient, uh, to deliver uh, things faster, cheaper, better, which their clients are going to want. But we also, for law firms, allow them to put their brains and their best practices inside the product, co-brand it, and resell it to their clients and open up new revenue streams on top of their typical full-service bespoke uh, work. That's really cool. And usually the question I'll ask the legal founders I talk to for this segment is, you know, who's the the target customer? And you've already talked about it's it's law firms, it's businesses, and it's in-house counsel. But when I was taking a look at your website today, before we hopped on this call, I noticed something pretty cool and pretty interesting. You also target accountants, sales professionals, and others outside the law. Tell us a little bit about that. Most contracts on this planet are reviewed and negotiated by professionals and non-lawyers, not attorneys because of the reason that I said before. And so what we're providing is a way for attorneys to get their brain in the hands of those people at a cost and at a speed that those people can afford. And we're also providing a tool that those people can use by themselves to empower them with a little bit of extra knowledge to make sure that when they are by themselves, which is most days, that they've got that kind of in-context assistance that they need uh, to get to a better outcome. Well, Kevin, cool. Really interesting. Great product. So tell us, where can people find out more about Legal Sifter if they want to? LegalSifter.com is the easiest thing to do. Today, you can come on and learn about our product in about four weeks if the trains run on time. So this podcast is on October 11th. Sometime before November 11th, you'll be able to come to our website and try and buy the product. So that's something we've evolved to over the first 14 to 15 months of the product. The product's about 14, 15 months old. And we are now ready to go on to allow people that come to our website to try the product and buy it without even talking to us come November. Uh, So really two ways. You can go and learn about it today on the site and then give us a call or send us a note and we'll call you and let you try the product. In about a month, you'll be able to do it without even talking to us. Let's get back to our talk with Keith Mazierik, the Director of Pricing and Legal Project Management with the law firm of Cat & Muchin. What do pricing and legal project management have to do with each other? A lot, as Keith explains. It is very hard to accurately figure out what you should charge a client if you don't plan ahead and figure out all the steps that you need to take to get a project done. That's where project management comes in. Pricing and LPM go together. They're sort of inextricably linked, right? So it's sort of a process, right? So even if you don't set a price up front that's based on certain assumptions, the way that the work is staffed is going to impact that price. And, you know, later on, that often often comes up in conversations with the client, which comes back around to pricing the next time, right? Because these are ongoing relationships. So, and on the flip side, which is the way it more often will, will present itself, you price the work, but you price the work based on certain assumptions and based on the analysis that you've done of past matters and the way that you look at staffing questions and where you're going to use technologies to try and help, you know, enable either collaboration or coordination, those kind of things. All those things impact the pricing that you use to build a budget or a workflow plan that you use in your in your legal project management process. So they're both sort of, it's, it's like a cycle that they both go together, right? In fact, the funny thing is when I first started doing the, both of these things at DLA, there was a lot of price competition, right? So, uh, and, and clients were asking for alternative fee arrangements all the time. The partners would come to me and say, hey, this client wants some other billing arrangement. So we'd work together and develop, you know, come up with our set of assumptions and develop our pricing models from there. And they'd come to me and say, hey, that's great. Thanks so much for the help. The client liked that fixed fee that we did or that partial contingency, whatever it was. We did it. I, and I would go to them and say, okay, look, we need to use the plan and assumptions we put together now to track against what your actuals are. Because if there's, if you're not following the plan, number one, we're not going to be profitable. Number two, we're going to miss opportunities to communicate with the client and say, look, the scope has changed or you know, there's, there are other um, issues that have come into play that are going to impact the price, so we need to be very well coordinated on that. And nine times out of ten, they'd say, yeah, 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 I get it. Um, I'll come back to you in like a month once I get going, and we'll set up all that LPM stuff you're talking about. You never hear from them again. And then a year, year and a half, they'd come back to me, and they'd say, man, I really got crushed on that deal. And I said, yeah, you know why? Let me take a look. So I'd look at, at how the work was done. I'd look at their staff. I'd look at you know, what ended up happening and ask them a couple questions. I'd say, well, it's pretty clear why, why you got killed on that from a realization or margin standpoint, you didn't do any of the things that we put down on the assumptions. And that was what the LPM side was for. And they go, oh, okay, fine. So so then that was a good sort of effective but sometimes painful way of demonstrating what the value is of actually measuring budget to actuals and you know the, the, the value of investing the time up front to plan out how work is done and then use that as sort of a blueprint to do it. And that helps you identify when things may be deviating. And as you know, with the reports that we can provide, we can help identify those deviations as soon as possible. So you can address them with the client or the engagement team, whatever it might be. So, so what you're saying is it's a fool's errand to come up with a price without actually figuring out how the work's going to be done in the first place. 
Yeah, the only time I wouldn't use that as a blanket statement. There are some categories of work that are very market driven, but those are also highly patterned, sort of high volume ones. So it just is what it is. If you can't do it for those prices, then you either shouldn't be doing it or you're doing it wrong. Generally speaking though, I would say, yeah, you can't just throw a number out there and say, yeah, I bet it'll be this. You also can't throw out a half-baked number because a lot of times you have to understand what the nature of the data that you're, that you're using as your reference point is for modeling the new one. So if you take something in a vacuum and you say, okay, I have a new complex M&A transaction, it's gonna be a cross-border deal. If if you look at the last one, the last one might suggest a certain number, but it also may not be very highly correlated with what the actual attributes of this new matter are. So if you use that in a vacuum, which you know people would do from time to time, they wouldn't kind of consider where they were similar and where they were different and what the implications of where they were different would be. That gives you a very um, you know um, uh, inaccurate uh, estimate of what the number is going to be, and all you're asking for is trouble. Then so so yeah, I mean it is I, a fool's errand. If you have somebody like me or people in your finance department or whatever that can go back and look at your data and, and break apart the numbers and give you some of these insights and go, you know, I see these levers. Tell me about why this happened or is this accurate here or is this relevant here? And can put together that puzzle of what this new matter looks like and know where you've got uh, similarities and parallels. It's well worth the time because just picking a number out of thin air or taking an average of a bunch of different old matters is, is typically not as as you need more specificity and more accuracy than that. And I've seen instances where partners will do that and they'll say, I think it's like these, and I'll say, well, why? And then I'll pull the number and I'll say, okay, well, tell me what it is that makes this new matter like any of these ones that we included. And as you go through the list of the ones we include, they'll go, oh, actually, you know what? It's different from that one. It's different from that one. It's different from that one. So the nerd data guy in me goes, all you're doing is making a big noisy data set. You've got a bunch of very unlike things in here that you're trying to predict the future with. And that's going to give you a lot of variance. So anyway, but so you do, it, it is definitely worth that extra level of diligence to go on the analysis side and, and understand better at a very granular level what is required or what you could or could not do or should or should not do in order to come up with the best price possible. We've heard Keith talk a few times about AFAs. Those are alternative fee arrangements. AFAs are an alternative to the billable hour, which is how law firms have historically billed clients. When clients approach lawyers about alternative fee arrangements, most probably think the client wants a fixed fee. Say, handle a routine contract negotiation for a set price. However, AFAs are more than just fixed fee arrangements. So I break it down into three categories now. Uh, and one of them I don't really consider AFAs, they're just some variation on what the billable hour model is. If you define alternative fee arrangement as not hourly billing, then those that last category is sort of on its own. I'll get to that one, that's my last one. You know, the first category is the fixed fees, and there's you know, obviously a you know, variety of different forms of fixed fee. You can do for a whole matter, you can do for a task, you can do by phase, you can do by milestone, you can do annually, those kind of things. So um, those are all the sort of varieties of fixed fees. The next category I use is more of the sort of risk sharing, sort of the more um, ones with a contingency or performance element, right? So it's sharing in the risk and sharing the reward with the, with the client on a, usually on a higher level, or I don't want to say a higher level, but uh, from a different perspective than a, a typical fixed fee would be. So example being like a partial contingency. So um, sometimes you'll use uh, a flat fee and say, okay, based on outcome, there's some other supplemental piece of compensation the firm gets. And if it's a good outcome, you know, based on the magnitude of the good, I'll say, right, we get a bigger uh, and better sort of reward or portion of that. And if, if you hurt, then we're not, gonna, we're not going to disproportionately uh, profit from, you know, what would be considered to be a failure for the, for the client. We want to be in this with you. So um, that's the second category of sort of the contingency related ones. The third category of the ones that I say aren't, I don't consider them true FAs, but they, they have a place. Um, but at their core, they're still measured as a function of hours times rate. And that's things like the fee collar, which has definitely has a place. Those are very interesting. I used to be in love with the fee collar. Which is? Um, so it's basically where you, you go through a very similar exercise of setting a fixed fee, but rather than just saying, okay, this fixed fee is either set in stone, what you do is you say, if it's within 10% above or below, based on some agreed hourly rates and the hours that we bill, we'll just pay, you know, we'll charge the client whatever that number is that we agreed on. If it falls outside of that, it's usually a scoping issue. If the scope was less than we thought it was going to be or more, um, in which case we have to make some other accommodation. And there's a whole spectrum of other accommodations that can be made. But I don't have a problem with that, but it still does come down to you're, you're going, okay, what is an hourly rate? assumption that we use for each timekeeper, which has got to be based on some discounted um, number typically, or even if it's a, a full freight number, to come up with what that range is going to be. And so that is sort of not exactly what I would consider to be like, it's not a, it's not a fixed fee anymore because it's, it's somewhat variable based on what that is. Whereas in a true fixed fee, you wouldn't, 
you wouldn't measure things as a function of time and rates. It would just be, okay, based on our experience in the past, you know, what do we see that this is going to be? And regardless of uh, slight changes, what does that mean? So the other ones that I don't consider to be true AFAs, that was the first one, um, just to round out the explanation there. Volume discounts, things like that, like blended rates. A blended rate really isn't an AFA. It's still a rate times hours. And if you do it right, it's a function of what you assume your staffing mix to be and those kind of things. So they are different tools and they're different ways of packaging your pricing and the work uh, as far as how you go to market with a client. But in terms of what the sort of more accepted or traditional definition of alternative fee arrangements is, they're not, they're, they still are based on, on hourly rates times hours. So that's why I don't consider those to be true, true AFAs. Keith wrote a great article for the ABA Journal about pricing legal services. I'll put a link to that article on the episode page at tlpodcast.com. Be sure to check it out. A lot of good information in that article. In the article, Keith talks about the four P's of marketing, promotion, placement, pricing, and product. Before reading that article, I hadn't really thought of price as being that much of a component of marketing. The four P's, I think, are more traditionally thought of in the like CPG context or that kind of thing, like like products as opposed to services or high end sort of you know differentiated services like legal is. But I mean, it's still it's still a model that applies. So price is is one of the four P's because the other three P's can impact what your price is, right? So product, you know, what it, what it, what is it? So in our case, it'd be service, not product, right? But is the work that you're pricing more commoditized or routine? And there's high you know price competition and a lot of different competitors and substitutes that you could use to do it? Or is it very bespoke type work where, you know, the people that you have at your firm are very specialized, you know, in these particular skill sets or these areas where they um, have a very unique value, very differentiated value, and that helps you protect your pricing power, right? So that's, you know, the product side of things. Placement is sort of another thing. Are you, you know, where do you fall? I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, in the, the legal industry from that perspective, where do you fall within the continuum of firms? Are you a global firm? Are you more of a local firm? Are you looking, you know, are you mid-tier? Kind of one of those things like, and then, and then what are the right types of clients or work that you're going to pursue based on what your placement is within the industry, right? So promotion is really, in a lot of ways, I think of the way that we articulate the aspects of what our placement and what our product are, our service are, right? So again, if you've got Think about like the old adage: if you know if a tree falls in the forest and nobody hears it, doesn't you know doesn't make a sound. If you've got the most specialized person in the world, but we're not, you're not good at either they or we as a firm are not good at telling the story and, and demonstrating and articulating to clients why this person is the greatest, you know, um, at what they do and what you know particular advantages or benefits that promises to them as clients that they work with us. If we're not good at promoting that in a way that's going to be helpful, you know, then either we're either not going to get the work or we're not going to be able to again impact the, the pricing power that we have as we price the work. Work, right, so you have to make sure that 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 to me is sort of how that model overlays in the in the legal industry in, in terms of how those how those different uh, disciplines sort of um, uh, interact with each other. I asked Keith what he would say to a law firm legal department that is kicking around the idea of hiring a pricing specialist. The types of questions and the demands, the, the nature of the demands that clients have had as they've developed more sophisticated ways of analyzing what their spend is, where their spend should be, who they're using and what's generating that spend, those kind of things. You know, they've gotten increasingly sophisticated in the questions they ask and the demands they make of the law firms that they work with. And those things are becoming pre-qualifying prerequisites for whether or not they're going to work with a firm. So someone in a pricing LPM type position or with that skill set is very well positioned to help not only sort of interpret what those needs are, but then translate them into, okay, I can make those um, actionable strategies for the firm. You know, I'm not saying anything that I haven't heard from a, from dozens of partners over the years. They didn't go to, to law school to do math. You know, they didn't, uh, a lot of these things that relate to um, what are the metrics we're looking at or, you know, how do you interpret some of the figures you have over large, you know, large portfolios of work and those kind of things. Um, that's not something that's that's within their, their sweet spot or what their comfort zone is. So to have somebody that is, you know, more versed in those things and in those areas uh, and can bring that, that to the table, it's a big advantage when working with clients that are asking for some of these things that are that are outside again of the of the traditional you know comfort zone or or uh, scope of what a typical law firm partner would be doing so let's say that the firm is not quite there yet are there things law firms can be doing regarding pricing without a dedicated position like you hold and if so, what should they be doing? If you're not going to create a whole new function for it, leverage the ones that you have. The ones I'm thinking of most are, I think, typically in most firms, like your, your IT department and your finance department or accounting or whatever my billing. It could be, you know, it depends on how you're structured, uh, where those fall. But data 
is is the biggest tool that we have in, in the arsenal to go, okay, when clients are asking me about these things and I haven't I haven't really looked at these types of challenges in a in a different way other than billable hours in the past, you know, looking at leveraging some of those people in IT to go, okay, what tools do we have that can help generate some of these some reports that maybe our clients are asking for? And that can be a learning process internally as well to go, okay, the client asked for this, let's pull it together. Let's interpret that on our own and say, oh, you know what, I understand what they're what they're trying to get out of this, or I don't, in which case that can, you know, initiate a, a conversation with the client as well. But anyway, back to the original question, leveraging what you already have to understand better how your work is being done and how that coincides or doesn't coincide with what the client's priorities are. So you've already got a lot of that information, you know, sort of um, uh, resident within your firm. It's a matter of tapping into the resources that can get it for you. And again, that's usually people that deal with the numbers and people deal with the tools that hold the numbers and can spit them out for you. So Getting close with those and, and trying to trying to get those initial sort of steps down of understanding better from a practice standpoint, from an office standpoint, however you're structured, from a from a, a partner, you know, each partner billing billing lawyer standpoint, where you're seeing the most revenue, where you're seeing the you know the staffing models, you know, coming up and down. Understanding better how again, um, this is sort of a data driven thing. Profitability is is you know has been the the new sort of mantra within the um, the community of, of people who do what I do since you know for for you know at least what probably seven or eight nine years now. Under Understanding better how you make profit as opposed to just how you make realization. Those will help you make different decisions as well. So you can work backwards from PPP and everybody's yeah, measure the, of those internally. So working with the CFO to understand, okay, on a more uh, individual practice level, how are we generating profit? And how does that work from timekeeper to timekeeper, from client to client? So getting getting a better awareness of what those parameters are, just as a general understanding. Again, these are things that should exist somewhere within side, within most firms in some level of sophistication or another. So so being able to just get started on, you know, what are those key metrics that that we can use to to measure kind of how we're doing what we're doing and what means success to us and what doesn't. Leveraging those in a way on a day to day or a month by month basis for my for my business. Those are I'd say some of the easiest first ways to do it. I think once you start down that path, you usually get one or two adopters that will start to go, you know, they'll, they'll get really into it. You always you always get several of people that are invested in it. They get curious and they go, oh, you know what I was thinking about? Let's look at this. Let's look at that. And they'll find some success. And those are the people that'll sort of bring those stories to the to the forefront internally. And that'll help build, you know, that'll help build momentum or awareness and uh, hopefully get to the point where you do want to build a function like that. That's that's how it works with people like us that, that do this as our full-time job. It's really trying to find and make those compelling internal cases and then scale them as much as you can. So that, that'll happen on its own organically as well. As I left Keith, he offered a great piece of parting advice. He pointed out that part of his job is to help lawyers figure out that sometimes the best pricing is none at all. That is not even bidding on work if it's not a good fit for the firm. Doing every piece of work that's put in front of you, um, regardless of what the price is, isn't always worth it. It shouldn't be worth it. There should be more of a strategy behind what you're doing. I know this is easier said than done. You know, a lot of times it's harder to turn away work when it's kind of on your doorstep. But it's one of the things that, again, if uh, the increased focus on profitability, have a solid and, and agreed upon uh, profitability model, you'll know when something's not profitable anymore. And it's okay to do some work that's not profitable as long as you're doing other work that is profitable. So people always will say, well, at least I'm helping keep the lights on, right? This is a loss leader. Well, if you look at somebody's book of business and 90% of it's loss leaders, that's not it's leading to anything. It's a loss, it's right? A loss. So I always say that, I, I don't know if I made up this tongue twister or not, but it's, you know, a loss leader is only a leader if it leads to something that's not a loss. So that's what I tell them all the time. You can do a loss leader and that's good. And that's got client value from a from a financial standpoint as well as a relationship standpoint. If you're not balanced Balancing that out with something that's you know more specialized and more profitable, then you need to kind of reassess why you're doing those loss leader type things. So that's one reason why it's not worth bidding on everything all the time. The other thing is clients have different tactics of either collecting information or using information that's collected to as as leverage in their negotiations, either with you or with other people. Just be mindful about that the information, the rate information you send or the bid you give out or the amount of discount you're willing to give them doesn't go away like a puff of smoke and it never, you know, it's it's not like uh, it doesn't disappear. That's that's captured in time forever and they're going to use that somewhere, right? You're basically, you're setting an expectation. And I think your point there is, and it has nothing to do with whether you should or should not do the work. Make sure you're bidding on a project that you actually have a chance because maybe the bid is requested just to get competitive intelligence. Sometimes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I'll give you an example. So sometimes big RFPs will come from companies you've never done work for, and it'll come to a partner that never met anybody at the, at the company. And one of the you know qualification questions then is, why do you think you got this? If you've never done work for this company and you, you don't even know anybody there, 
what is the point of us spending all this time to put together this proposal and this response and all these bids and everything? The probability of us ever seeing a dollar, let alone a profitable dollar from it, is pretty low. So you got to think, okay, well, why, why would the client send me that? It's probably either because they just had to get other bids and they already knew who they wanted to pick in the first place, or they're collecting market data that they're going to use, you know, from a organizational or a, you know, institutional standpoint on, okay, how are different firms in the market priced and how do we sort of start baselining those things? Uh, the other thing is sometimes they'll, you know, if, if you get an irrational bidder, you know, which, which I've been part of those things too, where you try and give the best advice possible, but there's a belief that if you just give the biggest discount, that it's all going to be worth it in the end. You know, you, clients will anchor to that and they'll say, either they'll come back to you in the future and say, we expect that same level of discount because you offered that before, whereas that might not be a sustainable thing or that might not fit the new, you know, piece of work that you're bidding on as, as well as it did the old one. Or they're going to go back to their other firms and say, oh, well, you know, we've got competitors of yours that are bidding 25% less or 30% less. And that's information that can be used you know, it can be leveraged in a way that's that's uh, can be advantageous in very one way, you know, in a very one dimensional way. So just being mindful of those kind of things. The other thing is too, and this is more negotiations. If you put in a bid and you get a response like the one I just mentioned, like, oh, well, you know, we think you're great, but all your competitors, quote unquote, are 25 percent less than you. You have to kind of ask some questions as opposed to just take it. Don't be an order taker. Make it a negotiation. Right. So counter that offer. Don't say, OK, if you know you can't do it for that cheap or you shouldn't do it for that cheap. There's a good chance that any of your direct competitors aren't offering it at that price either. The client, you know, is, is coming back to you and trying to say, okay, what can I extract out of this? You know, get the best price I want. And that's their job. They're always supposed to say, can you do it cheaper? What's the cheapest you can do it for? Totally understand and respect that. It's our duty on the law firm side to play, the, be the same steward to our firm and to our book of business and say, okay, if you tell me other people, quote unquote, will do it for 25% less, man, you know, I'd, I'd love to have this work and I want to I wanna meet you in the middle here, but I can't do it for that. How about 10% less than whatever it is? Obviously, after some careful anal analysis of what you can afford to do it for. But uh, but anyway, don't don't just assume that a counter offer is a walk away offer and you, you know, from the client and you can't, you know, engage in a, in a I'd say a, a fair and, and reasonable um, negotiation process to come to, to a point of agreement that works for both sides. So you always want win wins. Cool. Appreciate your time. Oh, hey, thank you. A lot of good info. A lot of good info there. Uh, so if people want to contact you, where do they find you? Uh, you can find me. I'm all over LinkedIn or uh, email is uh, first name dot last name. So K-E-I-T-H dot M-A-Z-I-A-R-E-K at catenlaw.com. K-A-T-T-E-N-L-A-W.com. I'm out there. So that's all we got for this episode. We thank you for tuning in. If you want to subscribe, you can find us on most major podcast platforms like iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play. If you like us enough, please give us a five-star rating. If you want to get a hold of me, you can find me at cmain at percipient.co. That's C-M-A-I-N at percipient.co. Thanks again for listening. And until next time, this has been Technically Legal.